Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, great to see such a crowd here, and thanks, Frank, for getting everybody in their, their seats first. That's always great. I'm David Pumphrey. I'm with the Energy National Security Program as well, and it's really great to have uh, this program come together in this way. We've been talking about this for several months as the issues surrounding rare earths had become more and more in the press and being discussed, but really we kept thinking, well, what are the issues that lie behind this discussion and what are the things that we're looking at? And it's really um, took us a while to pull together and start looking at the right people to come and start this dialogue, start this discussion, and we were really fortunate that our timing worked out so well with uh, the release from DOE of their study that they've been working on for six months or more, I think. Um, so it's really a, a great honor to, to be able to have this program. Um, the, our program's been, the Energy and National Security Program's been long focused on the question of the geopolitics of conventional energy and the supply risks that go with that. But as we move into this transformation of the energy sector, the concern becomes what kind of risks are we looking for there? What kind of supply chain risks? What kind of geopolitical risks will we be facing? And so one of the questions that came around, up around this discussion of rare earth elements was, is this one of those topics that we need to be concerned with? And so we thought it would be useful to look at resource base, the uses, the alternatives, what are the key questions that have to be analyzed? Um, now, for those of us of a certain age, um, rare earth uh, sort of is identified with something else. So I did a Google this morning to find out whether the rare earth minerals came up or whether the ban from the 60s and 70s came up first. And actually, rare earth elements does come up first now. I'm sure if I'd done this six months ago, uh, rare earth, the band, for those of you who are younger, I checked it out with Lee Hendricks, our uh, research associate, and she said, who? But at any rate, um, you know, th that would have come up first. So this is really shows how this has started to penetrate into the dialogue, into the public discussion. Um, we'll have uh, David speak first because he's going to do a presentation on the report. And for me, it's really great to have David here. I've known him for a number of years. He's a real leader in the effort to make this transformation of our energy sector and get us into a much cleaner energy system. And he's been doing this for, for a number of years, I would say, uh, both of his work now with as the Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs, but before with the work at Brookings and with the Clinton Global Initiative, and then previous to that in the Clinton administration, serving in both the State Department and the National Security Council. We have fuller bios uh, that have been distributed to everybody, but I just wanted to say, David, personally, thank you very much for coming, and it's great to see you here, and why don't you go ahead. Um, just the usual uh, administrative announcements, please uh, turn off your cell phones so that we don't have disruptions uh, during the time, and we will have time for questions and answers for David right after his presentation, and then we'll switch to another panel. Well, thank you very much, David. It is uh, terrific to be here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, one of our nation's leading think tanks looking at the issues that I work on. Uh, particularly great to be here with David Pumphrey, an old friend, as he says. We've been working together for many years uh, in different seats. Uh, David left the office that I now uh, am at before I arrived. Uh, but let me tell you, he leaves a legacy of a lot of respect, a lot of warmth. I hear from people in our office how much they, uh, they value and like uh, David Pumphrey. So it's, it's really terrific to be here. Um, and uh, thank you for your invitation. I know that this conference or this event has been in the works for a while. Um, we were delighted to accept your invitation um, to appear here uh, and use it as an opportunity to talk about this report that's been underway, as David said, in the Department of Energy now for much of the year. Um, and I'm going to, in the next 20 or 30 minutes, describe to you some research that the Department of Energy has done uh, and our findings um, and some of the conclusions that we draw from them. This has been an extraordinary team effort, and some of the uh, people who have been working hard on this are in the front row right here. They've just done an extraordinary job, um, and I want to applaud them and the entire team around the Department of Energy for all the hard work that's gone into this. Um, so let me see if the technology works here. Um, it does. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do today. Uh, I'm going to run through. Um, Obviously, background, our analysis, we looked at supply and demand, and then we did an analysis we call a criticality analysis, talk about a program and policy directions we looked at, and then next steps. Uh, here, here's the scope of what we did. And for some of you, I think, some of you are probably PhD chemists here and very familiar with what you're looking at. For others, this may be the first time you've looked at the periodic table since high school. Um, 
uh, the rare, the, uh, these are the elements that we looked at, and the so-called rare earth elements are the ones that are the second row from the bottom there. Um, and, and, but here's the point I want to emphasize. We looked in this study at four clean energy technologies. They're the ones that are pictured here on this slide. Uh, wind turbines, uh, electric vehicles, solar panels, and energy efficient lighting. Uh, we did not in this report look at the energy sector as a whole. We did not look at the economy as a whole. W one of our conclusions is that much more work needs to be done in this area, and we intend to do more research going forward. Um, but our work had a pretty specific focus. That's what we'll be talking about here. Uh, here's our timeline. We announced that we were going to do this in, in March. Um, in the spring, we released a public request for information. Uh, we got back 35 responses, uh, extremely helpful responses from a range of leading companies and experts in this area. We offered the opportunity to companies to provide proprietary data that we would protect on a business confidential basis. Um, then throughout the summer and the fall, we've been analyzing that data, uh, working on drafts. The report that we're releasing today is over 100 pages uh, and is available for downloading um, from the DOE website uh, this morning. Here are our goals, um, to assess the risks and opportunities associated with the supply of critical materials, to inform the public dialogue um, on this topic, um, and to identify possible program and policy directions uh, that we might pursue. There are three strategic pillars to our work. Um, First is diversifying global supply chains. Uh, for any uh, resource, it is important that we have multiple sources of supply. Uh, Winston Churchill, 100 years ago, uh, said with respect to oil, uh, security uh, rests in variety and variety alone, Some, uh, a quote like that. And the same is true today with respect to any critical material. It's important that we have multiple sources of supply uh, globally. Um, within the effort to diversify global supply chains, domestic production is especially important. Obviously, the most secure supply is domestic. Um, and so that's the first pillar. Second is developing substitutes. Um, it's extremely critical in any application that we have uh, substitutes, and so we're not reliant on any particular input. And then third is reducing, reusing, and recycling. Tremendous opportunities here um, for um, uh, doing all three of those things. Uh, the graphic at the bottom uh, underscores a point which is central to our work and became more central as we conducted our analysis, I think, and it, it is this. That th this issue of critical materials and rare earth mining, uh, rare earths, uh, it, th this issue is not just a mining issue. This issue is important across the entire supply chain. Um, I think sometimes it's presented as a mining issue in the media. This is an issue um, that we, we need to look at in terms of the supply chain from mining through processing uh, development of components to end-use technologies and then back in a loop of recycling and reuse. And we looked at the entire supply chain uh, in, throughout our study. So here is a chart uh, that shows the use of the materials that we looked at in different clean energy technologies. And just to kind of quickly summarize, you know, on, on the vertical there on the left, you've got the different materials we looked at with the rare earths at the top in addition, indium, gallium, tellurium, cobalt, lithium, uh, and then the specific technologies. You'll see, you know, as solar cells, PV films by and large don't use rare earths, but they do use indium, gallium, tellurium. Um, magnets, uh, which are used in both uh, wind turbines and vehicles, um, draw heavily on uh, neodymium and dysprosium, other rare earths. Um, batteries, nickel metal hydride batteries, and mish metal, cerium, lanthanum. Um, uh, and lighting and phosphors, or, or phosphors used in lighting, um, draw pretty heavily on some of the heavy rare earths, such as terbium. And it's a quick summary, and there's much more detail in our report. Um, so let's summarize the analysis that we did um, on this. Uh, first, we looked at supply. Uh, and a critical point here, particularly with respect to rare earths that gets so much attention, is that rare earth metals are not rare. Uh, <laughs> They are, in fact, found widely across the face of the earth. Uh, they are found in the United States. They're found in Canada and in Australia um, and in a number of other countries. Um, what we have here in, in this chart, uh, this useful chart, I think, is um, a number of mines around the world that have the potential to open in the decade ahead. And the numbers that you see is this expert assessment of the order in which these mines are likely to open. 
So in Western Australia, you see the one, and that's the uh, Mount Weld mine owned by the Linus Corporation, which is projected to open in the next year or so, um, bringing, uh, I believe it's uh, 10 to 15,000 tons in the first phase and then 10,000 more in the second phase of production. Um, uh, we have then in number two is the uh, Mountain Pass mine in, in Southern California, um, and uh, the Molly Corp Corporation, which just uh, which owns the mine, announced earlier this week that they have secured all of the permits that they need in order to operate that mine, um, and they expect to, they say, bring the mine online within two years. Uh, and then you'll see other mines around the world. Um, so rare earth metals are not in fact rare. I think the, the, the reason that this name uh, came to be is that where rare earth metals are found, they're found in very dilute concentrations in minerals when pulled out of the earth, but, it, but they are in fact broadly distributed across the face of the earth. Uh, here's a point that we thought important as we pursued our analysis. We, we call it co-production complications, and there's really two of them here. W one of them is that, that historically, when rare earth elements and some of the other materials we looked at have been mined, they have not been the primary extraction product, precisely because they are found in such dilute concentrations. They were often byproducts. Um, and so, for example, in the Baotou mine in China, um, iron has been the primary production product uh, with rare earths um, you know, as, as a byproduct. Uh, so that's one point. A, a different point on co-production is that rare earths in particular are often found co-located with thorium, which is radioactive, difficult to manage. Um, and so there is both expense and, and significant complications and in in environmental consequences in separating the rare earth elements um, from thorium where, where they're found together. So we looked at supply, we also looked at demand. Um, and just to quickly explain what we did in our demand scenarios here, we, or demand, we, we identified four scenarios um, uh, for each of the technologies we were looking at. Um, uh, we identified a high market penetration scenario for each um, and a low market penetration scenario for each. So, you know, in one scenario, we, we projected the possibility of lots of wind turbines coming onto the market globally and in another, fewer wind turbines. Um, and the same for each of the other technologies that we looked at. Um, and then we did the same thing with respect to the material intensity in each of those. So, for example, we looked at the use of neodymium in wind turbines in current levels and then based upon discussions with industry, we looked at how much that might be brought down, and that's a low material intensity scenario. And then we, we generated four scenarios, so kind of high deployment, high intensity, which would mean lots of this stuff being demanded, all the way down to low penetration, low intensity, which would mean less. Um, and some of this may be uh, somewhat difficult to absorb in a PowerPoint. There's, there's a lot more detail in our, in our uh, report. Um, I can explain where our, our, both our low technology deployment scenarios and our high technology deployment scenarios were drawn from work, uh, mostly work done by the IEA um, uh, for most of our technologies. Uh, here is a chart which is, uh, there will not be a test on this tomorrow, but um, uh, here's a chart which briefly uh, gives you some data on the high intensity and low intensity uh, content in each of our, for each of our technologies gives you a sense of what we did. So at the top for neodymium um, in wind turbine generators, based upon our industry surveys and discussions, we estimate that the average use of neodymium in a generator today is about 186 kilograms per megawatt, um, but that th there's a potential there to bring it down to 124. And so that was our high intensity and low intensity. We did the same thing for each of these. Uh, so here's a point that also emerged as important in our analysis, which is that the critical the criti these critical materials we're looking at are often a small fraction of the total cost of the clean energy technology. And here's an example with a plug-in electric car. Um, the, um, looking at the uh, cost of the materials that, that we're looking at here, um, neodymium, dysprosium, lithium, and cobalt in a plug-in electric car, um, over the course of this year, we think the input prices within a vehicle varied between about $280, $320. Um, which, and this is for, you know, a car that, you know, was ballpark $30,000 to $40,000 in cost. So obviously a relatively small percentage of the overall cost of the car, um, which means potentially the demand for those tech for these technologies are going to be slow to respond to changes in critical materials prices. It's, it's, we, we don't project that, um, you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling 
of the prices for these materials would necessarily have a material impact on the demand for the overall technologies. Uh, so we looked at clean energy's share of uh, critical material use. Um, and our top line conclusion is that clean energy's share of total material use is currently quite small. Um, but that it could grow significantly with increased deployment of these technologies in the years ahead. And uh, I've got two examples here. The first is on this page, and this is dysprosium, which is a, a rare earth element that's used in magnetics. Uh, currently, only about 16 percent of it is used in clean energy, for clean energy technologies. Uh, and uh, we project that by 2025, it could be as much as 62 percent um, uh, in high deployment scenarios. Um, and similarly with lithium, um, today lithium is barely used in clean energy technologies, but particularly with the deployment of electric vehicles in the years ahead, um, we project that it could be as much as 50 percent of global lithium use um, in, by 2025. Um, so I'm going to come back to and say a, a few more words about lithium in a couple minutes. Um, uh, so we did supply, we did demand, um, and then we pulled them together in charts that look like this. Um, and just to tell you, kind of walk you through a couple of them, this is neodymium oxide. Neodymium is used um, in magnets. Um, and the green and blue lines there are demand lines. Um, and what they show, and those are different scenarios, high deployment, high intensity, low deployment, low intensity. And you see that by 2025, we have potential for pretty significantly increasing demand. The red lines are supply lines. And at the bottom, you see uh, our current supply. Then we add on to it the Mount Weld mine in Australia. We add on to it the Mountain Pass mine in California. And then the very top line out to 2015 is are additional mines projected to come online by 2015. Um, after 2015, we, we were not making any, we didn't make any estimates of um, supply. Um, but we continued the lines there. But what, what that shows is that with mines projected to come online by 2015, there's a pretty big gap between where the supply will be and where the demand might be in 2025. And so that means something will have to happen. Either additional mines will have to come online, either additional technologies will have to come forward that um, provide opportunities for recycling, that reduce the use uh, of this. Uh, prices will need to respond. But there's going to be some type of market adjustment will be required here. Same with uh, dysprosium. Um, this is also a rare earth metal here. Um, this we identified as probably the most critical. Um, as I'll show in a moment. But here you see even less, we, we, we see less supply coming online um, in the next few years, um, dysprosium than in neodymium, um, just to compare. Uh, and then a word about lithium. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, there was uh, a kind of flurry of articles about um, peak lithium and concerns that, uh, that maybe the world is running out of lithium. Uh, I, I, almost all the um, uh, companies I've talked to in this space who have looked at this uh, have concluded otherwise, and our analysis bore that out. We do not see um, lithium supplies um, uh, being a concern in, in the years ahead. Um, there's lithium in Chile and Argentina, in Australia and the United States. Um, and if you uh, kind of walk through our charts, and you'll see that we, we think the world's in pretty good shape when it comes to lithium supplies. So we pulled this all together. Uh, I know this is a lot to absorb. Uh, but we pulled this all together um, in uh, what we call criticality assessments. This is a methodology that is based on one first developed by the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and we did it as follows. We, um, on the x-axis, looked at supply risk and different ways in which the supply of these materials are, uh, might be disrupted for clean energy uses and the risk that might happen. And on the, le on the, uh, on the vertical y-axis, um, we looked at uh, the importance of the clean energy economy. And so uh, in using that type of analysis in the short term, we, we found dysprosium to be the most critical element. Um, it's both extremely, it's important to various clean energy applications with current technologies and the supply risk is highest. Um, and down, uh, kind of moving from the top right to the bottom left, um, we found lithium, as I just said, samarium, some others to be less critical. We looked uh, in the medium term 
Um, there, here's the medium term, and here's kind of the shift from short term to medium term, medium term being 10 to 15 years, uh, excuse me, 5 to 15 years. Um, and uh, still, some of these elements remain pretty critical in the medium term. Um, there, are, there are, to be sure, and I want to emphasize this, there are opportunities for changing this story, if, and we're going to get to this. If we invest in research and technologies, if we respond with new recycling technologies, if we open up new sources of supply, this will change. Um, uh, but we're going to need to take action in order to address um, these, this situation. Which gets me to our program and policy directions. Um, uh, so we looked at eight categories of programs and policies. Um, the research and development, information gathering, permitting for domestic production, financial assistance for domestic production and processing, stockpiles recycling, education, and diplomacy. So a broad range of different types of policy responses. A, a key point, and I want to emphasize this, this is a DOE report that we're doing. It's just a it's a, we, we coordinated and talked with colleagues in the interagency community the federal government, but this is a DOE report. And so some of these areas are very much within DOE's core competence. Um, others are areas that, in which DOE has no jurisdiction. For example, DOE does not regulate uh, domestic uh, permitting uh, for mining, or does, does not we, we, we don't have, we don't work in that area. Um, but we looked at all these areas, talked with colleagues in the interagency process. Um, and I want to, and we have we have thoughts on each of them in our report. I want to talk about a few of them here, starting with the area that is most squarely within DOE's core competence, which is research and development. DOE is the nation's leading funder of research on the physical sciences, um, and has a long history of work in exactly this area. In fact, the Ames Lab in Ames, Iowa, is the United States historic leader since since World War II on rare earth uh, research. Um, and so Ames Lab has been doing uh, work on this area. Our Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Program has been doing work in this area. The Office of Science has been doing work in this area. And our, our new and very exciting program, RPE, has also been doing work in this area. Until um, this year, um, you know, for historically, this work had not been coordinated and was within different stovepipes within DOE. And one of the um, efforts that we've made is to pull these together um, so DOE is doing integrated work in this area. Um, we have, um, just to say a little bit about the, uh, the Office of Science is doing uh, work across a number of different um, topics related to materials research um, uh, out at the Ames National Lab on magnetic materials, um, uh, nanoscale processes, and, and uh, a, a variety of related topics. Our Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Program at the Department of Energy is already doing work on alternatives to permanent magnet motors, more, more applied work out of the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Program, um, looking um, at the topics up here with, with, uh, with magnets and motors. Uh, and our ARPA-E program is as well. I could explain this chart for anybody who's interested, but I have a sense that you might want me to move on. <laughs> um, but we can come back to it. Um, uh, so the Department of Energy in the past two months, uh, actually in the past month, uh, has done three workshops on this topic, um, which uh, indicates the seriousness that we attach to it. Um, two of them have been with international partners, which I think underscores how much of an international issue this is. Um, we did a workshop out of the Lawrence Livermore National Lab uh, in mid-November with Japanese colleagues looking at critical materials. We did one with European partners at MIT on December 3rd, and RPE sponsored one here. Uh, on December 6th. Coming out of these workshops, we have some pretty refined views of the most cutting edge research that can be done in this area and are planning on pulling together an integrated research plan for the department going forward in this area. Uh, one of my main uh, in conclusions after spending some time uh, looking at this literature is the, uh, the volume of the data gaps. It's really quite striking. Um, in some areas, how little is known and how helpful it would be to know more. Um, I, I'm struck that public entities, by and large, do not collect price production consumption data, and people tend to go to metal pages to find out you know, that type of data in this area. Um, there is uh, you know, little known publicly about the material intensity of different energy technologies. We collected some of that as a result of our request for information, but there's not much out there. And it took a fair amount of concentrated staff time for us to develop learning on that topic. 
Um, and in terms of individual technologies and the potential, potential for substitutes, there's not a lot of known there either. So one of our main conclusions coming out of this is that we need um, uh, additional attention to data gathering and EIA is exploring opportunities to do that, um, the Energy Information a um, Agency within the Department of Energy. Um, and we intend to, in the year ahead, um, have additional requests for information, hold additional workshops in order to gather in more information. Uh, another key point here is the importance of education and workforce training. Um, today there are thousands of researchers working on this issue in China. Um, there are dozens in the United States. Um, and in order for um, the world community to move forward as it needs to in this area, we need to develop uh, expertise around the world. And I think in the United States as part of our, the development of uh, our clean energy technologies in order to promote a clean energy future. Uh, we need to develop the human capital here um, to promote these technologies uh, in the decades ahead. Uh, as President Obama has said, um, improving education in math and science is about producing engineers and researchers and scientists and innova innovators who are going to help transform our economy and our lives for the better. And our human capital here is absolutely essential on this issue and on so many others. Uh, so just uh, I want to place this within kind of the constellation of related uh, government activities on this. As I said, this is just a DOE report. Uh, there is lots of other activity going on within the U.S. Uh, federal government on this topic. OSTP, the, op White Ho the Office of Science and Technology Policy within the Executive Office of the President, um, has uh, coordinated work on this area among federal agencies. USGS um, has just done an excellent report I commend to everybody on this topic. Um, DOD has a study underway, GAO and uh, Congressional Research Service also have reports underway, or, or actually uh, their reports are released. So um, to wrap up, our conclusions out of this report, um, first, uh, some materials analyzed are at risk of supply disruptions. Um, we identified in particular five rare earth metals, dysprosium, neodymium, terbium, europium, and yttrium. Um, along with indium and as assess those as the most critical. Second, clean energy's share of material use is currently small, um, but it could grow significantly with increased deployment. Third, critical materials are often a small fraction of the total cost of clean energy technologies, which means, among other things, that demand for those technologies may not respond quickly when prices increase. Uh, fourth, and I emphasize this again, data are sparse. Uh, more information is required, and Department of Energy looks forward to working with many people here um, and others to make sure that we have quality data on these issues in the years ahead. And then sound policies and strategic investments can reduce risk, especially in the medium and long term. So next steps, uh, we at the Department of Energy are going to develop an integrated research plan, building on our three uh, recent workshops. We're going to strengthen our information gathering capacity. We're going to look at additional technologies. Um, we're going to continue to work closely with international partners, with interagency colleagues, Congress, and public stakeholders. Um, and we intend to update the strategy and continue working on this, up, update it by 2011. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for listening. I'm uh, delighted to take questions. Uh, yeah. And, and two things. First, um, please go and download our report, take a look, um, and if you have any comments, um, both you in the audience, anyone listening, and anyone else, please let us know. We intend this to be part of a conversation. This, we do not intend this to be the last word on this topic by, by any means. Um, and please send your comments to materialstrategy uh, at energy.gov, and um, we'll be collecting them. And then. Um, I'll sit down and take questions, and I just want to highlight that our team here has got a lot of technical expertise, and uh, I may throw some questions to them uh, if anybody has th uh, stumpers for me. So thank you. Thank you, David. Um, uh, first, a couple of ground rules many of you are familiar with in terms of our questions and answers. If you can identify yourself uh, when you ask your question, and then please, if you can ask a question, uh, if you have a comment to make, if you can follow it up with whatever question makes sense at the end. But it's, it's always good to not have turn this into a, a uh, uh, discussion uh, session in that regard. Um, 
One of the questions that came to my mind, David, if I can start, is um, there's a lot of discussion about getting the industry restarted here in the U.S., and I know you focused mostly on the science and technology aspects, but um, did you get a sense of what will be the key issues in that pathway to get an industry restarted in the U.S.? Um, this is an industry that's got a pretty big environmental footprint, which may be um, a consideration. It also is going to require financing at a time when financing is still difficult to come by. So I don't know if you got a sense of what the issues will be faced by the industry here. I think you just identified some of the some of the key ones. Um, I think uh, you know the the human capital issue that I highlighted in my report in, in my presentation is really important here. We're going to need the trained. Uh, uh, trained professionals in, in order to, to do this. Um, I, financing will also be important. Um, I understand with increased prices um, in the past year that you know, financing opportunities look better, I hear, um, but uh, not surprisingly. But obviously financing uh, is, is going to be important. And, and, and I think just an understanding of the importance of this issue and the opportunities ahead. This is, this is an issue that is um, it, it's got challenges, but it has huge opportunities. This is a space where you know, lots of people um, can do lots of good things and prosper as a result of it. So um, I think it's the sustained attention that's going to make a difference, too. Okay. Good. So throw it open for questions. Um, please, we can start. Okay, we'll start here in the middle. The hands are up first here on the right on the left. There are, well, if you can wait for the microphones as well, it would be good. Phil Cushman, U.S. Marines. Um, I've been following the rare earth um, um, issue for about a year now in my spare time. And one thing I have not seen in the debate is very much that talks about the bureaucratic obstacles in order to implement, you know, all the uh, the measures that are proposed. And I was wondering if you could comment on um, some of the challenges you an you anticipate and how we can overcome them. Thank you. Um, that's interesting. I'm <laughs> interested to hear what you more mean by that, Phil. Uh, <laughs> but no, I think. Um, Speaking personally in terms of my participation within the U.S. federal government, we've had tremendous uh, kind of working relationships with other agencies around the government, um, you know, uh, good discussions. There's, there's, I, see, I see folks here from other agencies who are, you know, real experts in this area. Um, and so I think there's, there's been tremendous work together, um, you know, uh, among federal agencies on this topic. And, and I think we, it, within DOE, one of the things we hope to do with this report is really, you know, figure out within what the areas that we work on, how to overcome any obstacles um, and move forward. I guess, you know, the, the one obstacle that was clear to us as we started this project within the Department of Energy was that historically, although there had been work in the Department of Energy on this topic, it, it, it had been stovepiped. It hadn't, you know, it had been within different parts of the department who didn't always talk to each other. And so now we're bringing that together um, to make sure that we have the most efficient, you know, productive work in this area. I can actually uh, second that, that last comment. In all the years I spent within the office that you're in, I don't think we ever came across something that was quite as technical um, and as deep as this one on that topic. So yeah. I commend you for your ability to go through this PowerPoint so smoothly. It's, it's great. Okay. Um, another question right there in the middle, the second row, and then we'll go right here in the front. Uh, thank you. This is Amos Goodman from the Cohen Group. Uh, as you noted earlier on, uh, Clean energy is not the only use of rare earth. It's not even the majority use of rare earth. And the other applications are also very critical, things like industrial catalytics, aerospace alloys for defense and national security applications, things like that. Uh, as part of your report, did you look at the demand profile for these other applications and how they may be impacting as second order effects the criticality of these materials? We didn't only in the following way. Um, we looked at the current use of those, uh, of, of these materials, um, and then we projected their increase in the years ahead at the same rate of the growth of GDP um, So, in our analysis. We did not do individual kind of granularized look at uh, these applications. We just didn't have the resources to do it. Um, and we certainly welcome others uh, with, with, in, with data in that area. If you've got them, we'd love to see it. Question here in the front and then one to the side there. So why, don't, why don't we take both questions now so that we uh, sort of give David a, a chance to, to think through his answers. Jim Hedrick uh, with Hedrick Consultants and uh, retired from the USGS. Uh, the question I had was uh, the funding, uh, you mentioned that they needed to get um, a lot of training uh, for professionals to do processing and everything related to, to getting the rare earths up and running in the US. Um, and I know that a certain school in in Iowa had uh, dropped its support
for the Rare Earth uh, Research Center there. Uh, when you're looking at funding, uh, have you looked at which schools we're going to, uh, where that funding will go to start these programs uh, and looking towards schools that will support this? Okay. Why don't we get the, the question over on this side, too? Don Juckett, uh, uh, in the following order, the uh, Standing Committee on Earth Resources at the National Academy of Sciences and the uh, Energy Minerals Division of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. You uh, touched lightly on uh, an item which is outside of DOE's domain, and I appreciate that, uh, relating to uh, foreign policy issues associated with, with rare earth minerals. Uh, my question to you is, are you uh, at liberty to opine uh, and elaborate somewhat more broadly on those issues? Two easy questions. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Always fun to be here. Right. Uh, no, I, like on Jim's question on uh, on schools and funding, um, we didn't look in the report at kind of individual, you know, uh, universities and their funding patterns, that type of thing. Uh, but we did conclude broadly that there is a lot of opportunity here and a lot of need. Um, and it's certainly my hope in the years ahead that more resources go into this. I think there's tremendous opportunities um, for students uh, in the sciences and in technical fields in this area. Um, and certainly hope that they can, um, you know, uh, that, they'll, that they'll follow that path. Um, on, on foreign policy questions, obviously those have gotten a lot of attention. Um, we, um, Two pieces of this. First, we held workshops um, uh, with a number of other, you know, with, with other countries, as I noted. Kind of, and, and I think um, as I travel the world, I hear about this issue. Um, it was in Japan recently, and it was certainly a, a topic of a priority topic of conversation um, in Japan. Um, there's been a lot of attention to, you know, the Chinese actions um, in this area. The Chinese have said that they intend to be a reliable supplier um, of this, and and so it's it's a topic of conversation as well. Do you, have, how much, do you have time for a few more questions? I do. Okay. So just, just a few more questions, and we got to get back to the rest of the program. So we have one there and then one uh, in the middle in the back. Thank you. Uh, Sean Tandon. I'm a journalist with the AFP News Agency. Just following up on that, uh, is China a reliable supplier? Will it be in the near future? <laughs> why, why don't we get the other question, too, so you can... <laughs> Hi, Karen Wilson with Boeing. And a question on the uh, uh, supply. Is there any, I've heard different stories about how long it will take to create additional supply. And will there be additional supply in time to meet the surging demand? And is there any government action that's going to be taken to help jumpstart or involved, get involved in that creation of additional supply? Uh, so on the first question, um, to China has said that it intends to be a reliable supplier, and we welcome that. Uh, on, on the second question, <laughs> um, uh, that's what our report is, is focusing on, and I would urge you to go download it and read it in detail. We have a lot of sp you know, very specific information, uh, kind of element by element, on exactly the supply demand situation uh, you know, for each of these elements. Um, and, uh, and there is uh, a lot that can be done to enhance, um, enhance supply, both, by the way, you know, from mining, but also from um, post-consumer, uh, you know, f use, from recycling. Um, there's a major company had an announcement within the past week about new ways of recycling some of these metals. Um, so there's lots of opportunities there. So this is an area that requires you know, a, lot of, a lot of work, both from the government and private companies and research institutions in the years ahead. Uh, I, I, I do need to go, but I, I really, uh, I want, I want to applaud the work of our great team here, and I want to particularly single out Diana Bauer from the um, PI who led our team, did really great work on this, and if Diana would stand, stand up. up yeah. um, and then along with the rest of the team, Paul Tallinn, David Diamond, Brent Warner, and Jennifer Lee, really appreciate all their hard work on this topic. Just, David, I uh, just want to say thank you very much for coming over. It's really great to have you here, and uh, this is really important work, and hope to see it continuing uh, in the future. And maybe we can get you back in a year, and you can do the update. So, again, thank you, David, and good luck with your event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, join me in thanking David for his presentation.